Well, I'm not sure if you've heard, there's a pretty big game going on this afternoon, and a lot of us will be gathering together to watch it. Uh, very interesting. It's a game called the Super Bowl, if you might have heard of it, uh, featuring the Cincinnati Bengals and the Los Angeles Rams. And I'm kind of torn between. Um, I was actually born in Cincinnati, so I guess my heart could be like towards the Bengals, but if you know anything about me and my family, uh, we cheer for the Los Angeles Rams. That's what we're going to do. And yes, I force my sons to cheer for the Los Angeles Rams. If they eat my food, they will cheer for my NFL team. And that's how it goes. When they pay for the bills, they can cheer whatever team they want to. But once I'm giving food in their mouth, then they're going to cheer for the team that I want them to. So it is kind of a struggle. But actually, it's very interesting. After from being born in Cincinnati, most of my family is from Detroit. And that's where most of my family is right now. And if you know anything about the Los Angeles Rams, Matthew Stafford for 12 years was the quarterback in Detroit. And so now a lot of people in Los Angeles are excited because we have a good quarterback that took us to the Super Bowl. But a lot of people in Detroit are starting to be like, well, hey, can't we get in on this too? They're like, you know, we, we kind of groomed them for 12 years. Can't we be a part of this to the point where a sports apparel company in Detroit started creating these T-shirts that say Detroit Rams on them, okay? Detroit Rams. If you know anything about that, that's the combination of two teams, Detroit Lions and the Los Angeles Rams. And what they did is they took the Lions logo and they flipped it and they took part of the Rams logo and they put it on the Lion and they changed the font a little bit so there's no copyright infringement. But what they're trying to say is essentially we want to create a hybrid that fits us. We want to create a team that allows us to be a part of this celebration, although we're not legitimately a part of it which seems kind of sad and desperate for the people of Detroit, but such is the state of the city of Detroit right now, I guess. But if you think about that concept, a lot of people are like wanting that to fail because what they see is just a money grab by the company. This is benefiting you that you can hop on the emotions of the people who care for Matthew Stafford and you're selling extra t-shirts. So they're motivated by something selfish to create this hybrid that fits their needs. And I thought about that and I said, man, I think that's true of a lot of American Christianity. You create a hybrid of something that looks like biblical Christianity, maybe parts that you like of it. Maybe there's certain aspects of what it means to follow Christ that really entice you. Maybe you like the religious every week coming to church, but that doesn't save you. Maybe you like uh, studying scriptures and you like studying things. And so that academic aspect of the Bible intrigues you. Maybe you just like having community and we have a community of people here and I just want to be around people and all of these you create in your mind a hybrid that's not really Christianity. It looks something like it but on the day of judgment it will not stand before God. I think the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans has been addressing a lot of those things. If you got your Bibles, go with me to Romans chapter 2 and we're going to continue on in our series in the book of Romans and this morning see three hybrids of Christianity, three false versions of Christianity that we need to avoid, we have to look out for, make sure it's what we're not following because on the day of judgment, it will not stand. Romans chapter two, verses 12 to 16. You can follow along as I read. Romans chapter two, verses 12 to 16. It says this, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them, on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. What a really fascinating portion of scripture and actually very difficult to understand. So we want to follow along with the argument of the Apostle Paul here to make sure that we don't put something that we want into the text, but we're following along with his thought so that we know the thoughts of God. So we're seeing this word for in chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, which is connecting it to the previous verse, which we learned last time, there is no partiality with God. So Paul is making an argument, remember, when he switched from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to deal with these 
uh, Jewish objections that would come to the Apostle Paul. And why do you think Paul would know about all of these Jewish objections to the gospel? What does it say in the book of Acts? He would go to a town and he would spend what? Weeks in the synagogues, reasoning with them from the scriptures. So what you see Paul actively debating here against, even though it's a fictitious character that he set up in his mind, this is probably arguments that he's actually encountered with these people in the temple who are going to look at Paul and go, I understand why you say the Gentiles are going to get judged. I understand why somebody who is so bad and so disgusting in God's eyes will receive God's judgment. But Paul, you don't understand. I'm Jewish and that heritage means I'm okay with God. And that leads us to that first hybrid that we need to watch out for. So number one on your outline, look out for Christianity that is based solely on religious heritage. Look out for Christianity that is based solely on religious heritage. And that can be something that's tempting for us, even though it might not be the exact same way that the Jews were doing it. We might be tempted to fall on a version of Christianity, have a relationship with God simply because, oh, my, my parents always went to church. Therefore, I'm going to go to church and that means I'm a Christian. Well, that religious heritage isn't what the Bible says a vibrant relationship is with Jesus Christ. We want to think about the way the Bible defines Christianity and how does the Bible define Christianity? Well, Jesus himself said it this way, if anybody would be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So we know what it means, self-denial to follow Christ. Or to put it in the words of the Apostle Paul in another portion of scripture, he says this, The love of Christ compels us. Oh, what a beautiful statement that is. The love of Jesus Christ compels us. We understand we're saved because God has loved us and that love compels us, constrains us, conforms us, and pushes us to live more and more for Jesus Christ. And then he says this, therefore we concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. When you want to define what it means to have a relationship with God, you have to define it the way God has said. And that's what the apostle Paul argues. That's what Jesus argued. But these Jews are going, wait a second. Paul, um, remember, we have, we've got the law. God gave us this this heritage. He entrusted us with these words. We know the law, Paul. We've heard it. We're good, we're, we're Jews, therefore we're fine with God. But if that's your definition of being fine with God, your religious heritage will crumble on the day of judgment. So Paul is connecting it to the God showing no partiality in judgment. So he says, all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. Very interesting that he says it that way. You know why? Because that's the first time in this book that Paul has used the word sin. Now, very interesting because we need to understand this in the Bible. Sometimes it's talking about a theological concept and doesn't necessarily mention the word. But I think you would agree with me if you've been in our study from chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, what was the discussion about? Sin. He just called it a whole bunch of different names. Unrighteousness, ungodliness, foolishness, dishonoring of the body, dishonoring a debased mind, idolatry. He called it all these different names, but now he calls it sin. We have something called sin. We want to define it the way the Bible does. So the word means something like to miss the mark, to step out of bounds, to fail to meet a standard. So Paul is saying all who perish with, all who sin without the law, who haven't been blessed with this religious heritage of being entrusted with the word of God and understanding the law of God, all who sin without that, guess what? They're going to be judged without the law. So that's all that we said in chapter one. Why is a Gentile who doesn't have the scriptures necessarily going to be judged on the day of judgment because of creation, which we talked about in chapter one, and their conscience. Creation says, you know there's a God. You know there's something bigger than you out there and you are refusing to acknowledge it. Therefore, you have no excuse. But then remember 132, although they know the righteous requirements of God, they refuse to acknowledge it. So their conscience, because they're creatures created in the image of God, shows them, wow, this this deserves punishment. I understand this. I get that, but I'm going to push that aside. I'm not going to listen to that aspect of my conscience, and therefore I'm going to do what I want to do. So creation and conscience will condemn the Gentile on the day of judgment. 
And there's no partiality with God. No one's going to be able to say anything other than that. But to the Jew, they will be judged according to the standard that they received. And what standard did they receive but the word of God? We want to see that this shouldn't be a shock for the Jews. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. And in Jeremiah 11, we're going to see what the Jews should have anticipated because they have been breaking the law of God. Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, or 1 to 8. Jeremiah 11, 1 to 8. So the children of Israel, when they received the law, God promised them in Deuteronomy 28, if you keep it, you will be blessed. I will bless you and prosper you. But if you don't, I'm going to bring curses upon you. And we start to see in Jeremiah 11, one of the prophets of God saying, remember what it means to have the covenant of God. You are held accountable to it. Jeremiah 11, verses 1 to 8 says this, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Hear the word of the covenant and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed be the man who does not hear the words of the covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people and I will be your God that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey at this day. Then I answered the Lord, so be it. Listen, verse 6, and the Lord said to me, proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of the Lord and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore, I brought upon them the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not do them. Now, notice what is being said here. The Jews were entrusted with the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, God giving them the Ten Commandments and all the other ones that came after that. And the Jews thought, okay, I've been handed that. That means I'm good. But what the covenant constantly said is you will be blessed if you live these out. Now, that does not mean you will be saved if you live these out, but you will be blessed because you are keeping the covenant. But notice what he said. There's something about the heart of the people in the Old Testament. The heart was evil. So no matter what external form of the word of God they had, they could keep all of these and religiously observe a number of the events, but if the heart is rotten behind it, then it's not going to help them because Isaiah said, these people will honor me with their lips, but their Hearts are far from me. So just because I have a religious heritage of a long line of people who have all believed the same thing, but I don't have a heart change, I need to make sure that I realize I don't have a relationship with God. Now go back with me to Romans and watch why Paul's going to say something. It might sound a little controversial. Romans chapter 2, verse 13. So all who have sinned under the law, they're going to be judged by the law. The Jews should have anticipated that. It said that. And then he says this, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. If you're a Protestant Christian in the room, your ears should perk up right now. Okay? Because if you know anything about the Reformation, what the... Martin Luther, I almost said the Apostle Paul, but he was really quoting a lot of the Apostle Paul, so not anachronistically. Martin Luther was standing up to the Roman Catholic Church saying, hey, you're talking about a works-based religion and justification comes by faith alone. So why is Paul saying that the doers of the law will be justified? Is he now introducing some form of works-based salvation? Well, it's good that you have those antennas up, but just read the text clearly. It just says the hearers of the law aren't righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Notice that it doesn't say will be justified by their own works because that would be a false gospel. Those who do the law will be justified by their works. That would be a works-based salvation. And Paul, as we pointed out last week, if you just flip over one chapter, 3.20 says this, by the works of the law, no human, we, no human being will be justified in his sight. Notice, by the works of the law, no one can justify themselves but if God has justified you, then you will be a doer of the law. 
And that shouldn't be a shock to any Protestant. You know why? Because Jesus said the same thing. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Matthew 7, verses uh, 24 to 27. So Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, what he's doing is really given an exposition of the Ten Commandments, the law that the Jews received, but he goes much deeper than just the religious external things that you can do. He hits at the heart because he says, hey, it's great that you've never murdered anybody, but have you been angry enough in your heart that if there was nobody around and you had opportunity to do so, would you have done something so heinous and to hate someone in your heart is just as bad as killing them? Or how about you, if you haven't committed physical adultery with a person, great, but guess what? If you lust after somebody, it's like you've committed adultery with them in the heart. And so Jesus is just pressing upon the point. You have to have internal transformation for your external actions to be worth anything with God. But how does he end the Sermon on the Mount? 7, 24 to 27. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded by the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So please listen to this this morning. What I'm saying to you, I hope it doesn't sound judgmental, but is really asking you to consider what is the foundation of your life. Do you have a form of religious heritage that you're banking, well, because I was brought up in church, because I believe in good morals, because I, I've gone to the same place over and over again that I'm okay with God, because external actions alone will get you nowhere, because you're not really hearing the law and doing it. The law will tell you your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things who can understand it. Therefore, if I put faith in God, I will be justified. And I'm just quoting Old Testament text after Old Testament text that the Jews should have known. But once you say, I believe in God, I must be a doer of the word or else I'm fooling myself when judgment comes. Listen to James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. This is Jesus' bro, okay? This is, his, this is literally his brother, like literally. Not just brother in Christ, this is literally his brother, okay? James 1, 22 through 25, listen to this. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Guys, understand this. This is not harsh, judgmental, religious preaching. I'm trying to beg people not to be self-deceived. Because if I think my religious heritage is the basis for my relationship with God, I will end up in hell. That is a false gospel. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Why? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently into his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks perfectly into the law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. You get the blessing from God, being his child, that he is saved by grace when you listen to his word and you do it. To be clear, this is not works-based salvation at all. Maybe this illustration will help you think about it. Uh, it might shock you. Uh, I get uh, invited to people's homes but sometimes I think it's for nefarious motives or just certain reasons. I was invited over to somebody's house and I was like, oh, this is gonna be so fun. They're like, yeah, because we got Mormons who keep coming to our house and we want you to be able to help them, like convert them. And I'm like, did you really want me to come over or did you just, you just wanna use the knowledge that I know about that. So it's just, I can't judge people's motives so I won't do that, but I did get invited over. And so I was like, okay, it's for the gospel. I will go do this. So I've started to like read up on Mormonism and just reminding myself of the different truths because Mormons preach a gospel based on works. You have to understand that. And then I started to watch some YouTube videos. You can watch great debates that they have online between Mormons and Christians. Very helpful just to think through these things because they will act like we're singing from the same song sheet and say words and phrases that you'll be like, 
well, that actually sounds right, and, and I think I believe that. But when you press the point home, they really believe in their effort somehow getting them to God. So I was watching this one debate, and I thought it was very helpful. It was this Mormon and the Christian pastor. The Mormon goes, hey, can we both agree Jesus is the mediator? Christian pastor rightly goes, yeah, absolutely, like 100%. I'm with you. Jesus is the mediator. And he goes, isn't it great that a mediator is essentially like a, a bridge builder, someone who helps us get to God? The Christian pastor's like, yeah, amen. We're talking about the same thing. Let's keep going. And then the, the Mormon goes, and isn't it great that because we can't build the bridge fully, Jesus comes and he completes the bridge for us so we can get to God. Do you see what he did there? He just said, we build part of the bridge and Jesus comes and fills the rest of it so that we can get to God. So he says, we need Jesus. Well, we would agree we need Jesus, but in very different ways. Because you've just promoted a works based religion. If it is my efforts plus the efforts of Christ, that's the gospel that Paul says in Galatians is a false gospel that will send you to hell. Why? Because your good works cannot be the basis or foundation of your relationship with God. It is never earning by your good works. It is never establishing by them. It is simply evidence. That's what the good works are. They cannot be the condition. Good works must be the characteristic of your life, but it cannot be the condition. And what they're saying is if I do 50% and Jesus is 50%, I need Jesus. No, you don't understand your need of Jesus. The Christian pastor picked that up and pushed him on it. And he goes, okay, well, I'm not saying like halfway, like what if I just build an inch? What if I build an inch of it? And he goes, that's still a false gospel. Do you guys realize that if you were to look up one of the deadliest bridge crash crashes in the United States of America, do you know that it started by a three millimeter crack in one of the bolts? When they did a forensic study of it, a three millimeter crack, that's all it took to compromise the sturdiness of the bridge. Three millimeters is nothing. You think you build an inch and Jesus builds the rest, the bridge will fall in trying to get to God. Jesus is the full bridge. His work is complete. It is finished. But what we're saying in the Christian life is this, that if Jesus is the full bridge and he has saved you and redeemed you, how you walk on that bridge does matter. Being a doer of the law is good because you realize you've been saved by grace and you are not worried about the bridge collapsing at all because it's firmly on the foundation of Christ alone. But how you walk across matters because the gospel is not just as we've said fire insurance to save you from hell and it's not just about your eternal destination although it is including those things it is a transformation to change who you worship now and forever and if you watch the apostle paul back in uh, romans chapter 2 you will you will see that he's trying to make that shift to show the jews this exact same thing so go back to romans chapter 2 see if you can't follow along with me as we do this so he says, it's not the hearers of the law who will be justified, but the doers of the law, because they prove that they have the faith that has really brought them to salvation, completed by Christ. They are good to go uh, by faith through grace alone. But notice what he says in verse 14, okay? The doers of the law will be justified. For, so he's connecting it, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their consciences also bear witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So what Paul is beginning to point out now is what the beauty of the new covenant is. The Jews were saying the old covenant, we got it, that means we're good with God. But even inside that old covenant, there was a promise of a new covenant that would come that would not just let you do things externally but would go inside your heart to change your life and that's what the gospel we proclaim does so number two on your outline write it down this way look out for a christianity notice these are in quotes look out for a christianity that does not bring about spirit-filled transformation look out for a version of christianity that does not bring about spirit-filled transformation 
Because you might not be saying, well, my heritage, it gets me in. You might be saying, no, I believe fully in the work of Jesus Christ. He has saved me. It's his work and his work alone. And we agree and say yes and amen. But then if the person's life looks like the life that they left, the life that they were to put to death, the life that is dishonoring to God and that continues on in their life, what the Bible says is that person should test themselves to see if they're in the faith. Because when the Holy Spirit comes in, when God saves you, there is a transformation that does not happen automatically overnight. It is a progression that happens throughout your life, but you have to see the progress. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Notice what he says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. Two times in Romans, I'll just write it down because we'll get to it later on. Romans, I think, uh, 9.30 through 32. Romans 9.30 through 32. That's the only one I can remember off the top of my head, so just write that one down. That's a time where he juxtaposes Gentiles as Christians versus uh, Jews who are just doing things externally because of a religious heritage. So Paul uses this often because there is a debate where people are saying, is the Gentile being spoken of here a non-Christian Gentile that Paul's using to shame the Jews? Or is he saying, no, this is a Gentile Christian who has experienced the benefit of the new covenant and is living out a life pleasing to God because God has saved him. I think either one of those interpretations can fit into the scripture, but I think it's the second one. I don't think Paul is saying this is just some unsaved Gentile who can sometimes do the things that God has called him to do because he is a creature made in the image of God. That's the argument we made, chapter 1, verse 32. Here, notice a lot of differences from chapter 1 Gentile to this Gentile right here. So let's talk about it. There's a really big debate. You don't need to know the the ins and outs of it. But punctuation, you got to know, matters when you're studying. Now what's interesting is when the Greek's written, there's no punctuation. So they've made an interpretive decision. So listen to this. When Gentiles who do not have the law, comma, by nature do what the law requires, meaning in their unsafe state, by their nature, they just do something nice. They're walking in agreement with God. That's an interpretation that you can take based off of how it's written in the original languages. But note what happens when you take that comma and you move it to to the right. It changes the way you read the sentence, doesn't it? For the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, comma, do what the law requires. Do you see how that changed? So the second one is talking about a pre-conversion state where the Gentiles, they do not have the law by nature because they're Gentiles and they're not Jews, comma, when they do the works of the law, it shows that something has been done to them. And that's a big deal in the text if you interpret it that way. Because now it's saying to these Jews, those Gentiles that you just judged, by faith can come to be part of the family of God. And to quote later on in Romans, their uncircumcision can be counted as circumcision because they genuinely believe in Jesus. So that phrase by nature is very important. And I think Paul, when he uses the phrase by nature, he's talking about identity, not behavior. Two scripture passages just to write down. We won't have time to turn there. Uh, Ephesians 2.3. Ephesians 2.3. says this. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and of our mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So he's highlighting the identity or the, the kind of person that we are. We're children of wrath there. And so here, I think this is highlighting by nature what a Gentile is. It's somebody who we just learned doesn't have the law and they will be judged without the law. So how does a Gentile come to have the law brought upon them? God has to do something to them. Notice what he says in verse 15. What is done? They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bear witness And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Notice that phrase, the works of the law written on the heart. That's important. Why? Because that's the promise of the new covenant in the old covenant. Go with me to Jeremiah 31. Let's read it. What should we expect when we get saved? What should we expect when we enter into a new covenant relationship with Jesus? We in the church are a new covenant people. 
And Jesus said, this is the new covenant that I'm ratifying in my blood. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So we see that the covenant of God in the Old Testament, it wasn't God's fault. Wasn't anything wrong with the covenant. Romans 7 will say the law is good, holy, and righteous. What God promised and gave to them should have been a benefit to them, but they had a messed up heart. They had something that needed to be changed and nothing they do can change that heart. Only something God does can do that. Listen to what he says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor saying, or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That last aspect is the gospel promise that we focus on the most. And it's right and true and we should rejoice. Because if we can rightly say there is no condemnation for a Christian, that every sin you have done in the past, are currently doing, or will do in the future is covered by the blood of Jesus, that should bring you joy. And if all you have is religious heritage, that will mean nothing to you. But when we sing these songs at the beginning and we confess that Jesus is our only hope, that has to mean something to you. Because you could do nothing to wipe your iniquities from God's mind. He knows it all and would choose to remember it. But in his grace, he says, I'm going to give you a covenant that if you enter into it with me, I will remember your sins no more. Think how beautiful a promise that is. But that promise is wrapped up amongst other promises of God doing what? Taking the law that's external, that is good, righteous, and holy, and doing what? Writing it on our hearts. Therefore, that's the internal transformation, the internal affection that we said that when that matches external action is something that is pleasing to God. So now when we are on the narrow road or we're walking across the bridge that Jesus has secured for us, it matters that we are doers of what he said because he's given us the ability in our hearts and our minds to know him and therefore to live this out and to become more like his son. Now turn with me to the New Testament to see how this applies to us. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Just listen to these words on the lips of the Apostle Paul, who is an apostle to the Gentiles. So we get grafted into the new covenant by his grace. As you're turning there, think what that would do to these Jewish people that Paul is trying to minister to. They think that they're good because God gave them a covenant and that's all they need. No, I was your husband and you left me. Now I'm making a covenant with the house of Israel, but that covenant's going to include Gentiles who will come in who will be sons of Abraham because they believe and do what I say. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 3 to 6 says this. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the human heart. Such is the confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Do you understand that statement? Not to claim in ourselves that we are sufficient, that anything comes from us. So if I'm up here preaching to you saying you need to be a doer of the law, you must follow Christ faithfully, you better not think that it's because you are doing it. You are insufficient. Our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers, watch this, of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. 
You must have life as a Christian. He died so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Do not accept a version of Christianity that says, I just believe that Jesus covered my sins and I'm good. That's not what the Bible says. What should happen to us? Look at the end. Chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Notice this. But when one turns to the Lord, there's a word for repentance, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. One of the greatest privileges you have as a Christian is that you get to look more like God's Son. Do you care about that? You are going to be conformed into the image of Christ the one that God looked on and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. How is God going to look at you and say that unless you become like his son? Watch this, from one degree of glory to the next. We are by no means saying this is overnight. We're not saying that this is easy. In fact, it's the most difficult thing that you will do this side of heaven. Because we have the world, the flesh, the devil, everything against us. But if we believe it's the spirit doing it, greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. So do you believe that this is the gospel that saves? Do you believe it's the gospel that comes in and transforms? Do you believe it's the gospel by the spirit that makes you more like Jesus Christ and allows you to give effort? You turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Listen to this. Philippians 2 Verses uh, 12 and 13. Philippians 2. Verses 12 and 13. Listen to the argument of the Apostle Paul here. Okay? Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. Okay? Is Paul talking about perfect obedience there? No. You have always obeyed. It's the consistent character of your life. You are becoming more conformed to the image of Christ. So now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, listen, it's not just based that you know the Apostle Paul. It's not about me. It's about the work of God. What does he tell them? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For, here's the reason why you can do that. Why can you work out your salvation with fear and trembling? For, it is God who works in you, both to will and and to work for his good pleasure. Christian, that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, living for his good pleasure. Any other version of Christianity is not what the Bible's saying. And God is working in you both to will and to work so you can give all the effort that you can. Now, I am very hesitant to talk about the Olympics right now. Last week, I spoke about the Winter Olympics and in a kind of a derogatory fashion. And I got shock and awe and gasp from you people. So just know that I'm not trying to demean the Olympics now. I'm just bringing them up as an example. But it's the, I think it's the summer games, and so we can all agree the summer games are fun. Do you guys know badminton is an Olympic sport? That's awesome. I, if I could be an Olympic athlete in anything, it would be badminton. I love that game. It's incredible. The only next best thing would be pickleball. And if they put pickleball in the Olympics, then I'm going to that. But badminton, very close. You know, in the 2012 Olympic Games, controversy in badminton. And you're thinking, oh man, steroids, right? Like they're, they're pumping themselves up so they can hit the shuttlecock. Is that what it's called? Hit the shuttlecock over the net farther. No, you know what the, the big controversy was in 2012 Olympics? I think it was the London Games, badminton. There was a number of countries that were disqualified. Why? Because they refused to give their best effort in their events. In the opening rounds, they do a seeding. And what three countries were doing was intentionally losing inside of a match so they would get an easier route to the medals. But the Olympics have a standard. 
that says when you are in these games, you are representing your country and you better represent it by giving your best effort. Does the Olympics kick people out because they don't win gold medals? No, that's the point. You're supposed to strive to do your best, but if you're there and you're doing it haphazardly or you're not giving your all, you will be kicked out of the Olympics. What do you think it means to be in the kingdom of God? You give your best effort every single day because God is at work in you both to will and to work. Will you be perfect? Absolutely not. And you will appreciate more and more the grace of Christ when you realize my best efforts, I realize I can't be perfect. But what does Paul say? Philippians 2, 12, and 13, 12 to 16. Not that I've already obtained it or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Everything for the glory of God. One degree of glory to the next. Don't accept a version of Christianity that will let you not do that. Go back to Romans chapter 2 though. Notice what he says. Romans chapter 2 says that they also have something else that's working in congruence with that law written on their heart that God did because they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They are justified. And remember our phrase is justification is a verdict that demands evidence that's aligning with everything that we're saying. The verdict that God gave is final because it's based off of the work of Jesus Christ. The evidence that's demanded is the good works of the obedience that you progress more and more like Jesus Christ because God is at work in you. But notice you also have this benefit too. With the conscience also bearing witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when according to my gospel God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Now notice this about the conscience. It can be a great gift from God. What we have to understand, and we'll talk about more when we get to Romans 14, is that the conscience is not the Holy Spirit. You have to get those two things different. Conscience can be impacted by a number of different things. It can be brought up by your upbringing, what you study, your life experiences. It just can be brought up by a number of different things. But the conscience acts when you devote yourself to a standard and you start to deviate from it. And so there's varying levels of harsher conf- consciences or softer conferences, con- consciences. So it's, it's probably good to put it this way. The conscience is not infallible, but invaluable. So if you remember that about the conscience, it's very helpful. The conscience is not infallible, meaning the conscience can make a mistake. Right? Somebody's conscience can be too tight and make them feel like, oh man, do I even you know, know God? Or it can be too lax. So it's not infallible, but it's invaluable in helping you follow Jesus Christ. Because the more we calibrate our conscience to the testimony of the scriptures, the more we're going to see it help us walk in line with God. But it's not infallible. It can make mistakes. So we want it to line up, have our conscience match that of Jesus Christ. Can you turn with me to Romans 9, 1 real quick? Just look. This is what we want. We'll get there later on. We'll talk more fully about this. Romans chapter 9, uh, verses 1 and 2. Listen to what Paul says. Uh, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. So we see a distinction there. It's not the Holy Spirit. It bears witness with, similar to what he's saying in chapter two. And what is it bearing witness? That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off for Christ's sake for my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. What's Paul saying? If I could take a look at these Jews who are self-deceived and I could throw myself in the pit of hell so they would go to heaven, I would do that in a heartbeat. Paul knows his sacrifice means nothing, though. It's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But his conscience is aligned with that of Jesus, right? What does Jesus do when he looks out over Jerusalem? He weeps. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Those who killed the prophets, if you only knew what I was offering you today, So he has the same heart, the same conscience as Christ. That means his conscience is invaluable to him if it's aligned with the word of God. But we'll get to Romans 14. There's times where it deviates from that. And we don't always follow our conscience. We follow the word of God. But Paul says you have that working for you and your conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse you. You can just write down 1 John 3.20. You'll see a, a part where sometimes our hearts do condemn us. If our hearts condemns us, God is greater than our heart, 1 John 3.20. 
Um, it helps us understand the conscience a little bit better. But we want to get to point number three where Paul goes in verse 16. Notice what he says there. On that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. This brings us to the last hybrid version of Christianity that you will see today. That's a Christianity that lacks judgment. You can talk about the love of God all day long and people will applaud you. But the moment you say that there is a judgment coming, then people, whoa, that's, that's not the God I love. That might be true, but that's not the God of the Bible. Because over and over again, we see this idea of judgment coming. And again, it's not that we relish in telling people that God is going to judge them. We realize that the only reason we can stand confidently in the presence of God is because we have the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, as our substitute. And so we don't fear condemnation, but we do beg and plead with people, listen, you don't want to stand before God. Why don't you want to stand before God without Jesus? Did you see what the text says? God will judge the secrets of men. How many of you will raise your hand and say, every secret that I've ever had, I'm ready for somebody to judge? How many of you are ready for that? You know and shake in the inward being that if everything were to be revealed about you, you could not stand. And the God of the Bible is omnipresent and he's omniscient. He's everywhere and he knows everything. You do not fool him. That's why to have no condemnation feels incredible. Because when I stand before God, and all those accusations, according to the devil, say he doesn't deserve heaven, Jesus goes, on the basis of my work, he does. And Jesus never sinned, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. But if you don't have that, your secrets are going to be out there. Do you want that? I mean, just think about that. You will watch this afternoon. They did uh, like a preview, sometimes they do a preview of the Super Bowl commercials. There's a Super Bowl commercial coming out about Alexa that uh, I think it's Amazon's uh, like uh, autonomous robot that reads your thoughts. And you laugh at that, but that's the point of the commercial, okay? The, this husband and wife Hollywood couple come in and they're like, uh, Alexa, you know, will you put such and such on a shopping list? And she's like, yeah, would you also like me to add su- something else? And they both go, it's almost like Alexa can read our minds. And then they daydream. And this Hollywood couple, the wife stands up and she does just a horrible um, one-person show for her husband. And the husband goes, oh yeah, sweetie, when is, your, um, when is your show again? And she goes, oh yeah, March 8th. And the husband goes, he's thinking something in his mind. And Alexa goes, reminder, set March 8th as the date to fake my own death. Okay, because it's saying the thoughts that he doesn't want his wife to know. And the point of the humorous commercial is, can you imagine if it were true that someone could know the inner recesses of your heart? What if Alexa did walk around with you, everything you said, everything you thought recorded on there, and then one day you stood before God and hit play? Everything. What would you do? You would go to hell. You know why? Because the worst, most debased thoughts, God knows you thought them. And what does the law say? I don't need to do an action. I just have to think it. I think that action, I'm guilty of it. And if that is the scruples that God is going to judge, what hope do I have without Christ? But the gospel that Paul preaches, his gospel that he believes and banks his life on and devotes his life to, is that God will judge those But if you have Christ, he bore the judgment for you. So you don't have to suffer for it. And God can be just and the justifier. Do you know what else is happening though? This is again a motivation for us. Not only is that the the judgment that comes from condemnation, which we have right here. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to what Paul says for us as Christians. We've talked about this before. There's the judgment of condemnation that we cannot stand because God will judge every thought and intention of our heart. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 5 says this. 
This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time comes, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Listen, you as a servant of Jesus Christ, you don't want to have ill motives. Why do you get up on a Sunday morning? I have to ask myself that question. Why do I get up on a Sunday morning? Do I care about the applause of people or being faithful to the word of God? Why do you serve? Why do you do what you do? You're going to stand before God. He's going to disclose that. And then you will receive your commendation from God. And what you want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant. But the judgment's coming. Don't accept any version of Christianity that does not say that. That's what we need to look out for. Look out for the version of Christianity that lacks judgment. All this Paul says because it matters how you will stand before God. And if you are standing based on your own works, those works will crumble and you will go to hell. If by God's grace you've been justified and brought into the family of God, you will enter into eternity, enjoy worshiping God, and that better make a difference in your life right now. So let us make every effort together to bring glory to God while we have a breath and then one day spend eternity together glorifying God. Let's pray that he'd give us the strength to do so. Father, you are good and kind and righteous and holy. And Father, we forget that to our neglect. Thank you for providing us Jesus Christ. God, we do not just want to sing words with our lips, but we want our hearts to honor you. And God, that's what Jesus wants. He wants us, uh, as we're gonna study in a few weeks, the circumcision of the heart. He wants our hearts to be changed. He wants us to make sure that we devote ourselves fully to him. If we've been saved by him, our life belongs to him. Our life is hidden with Christ in God, as it says in Colossians. So Father, if, if the love of Christ truly compels us, and that is the version of Christianity that you want us to live by, help us to accept nothing less because you get no glory in that. And God, may we thank you and praise you because you alone are worthy. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen.